So now we want the, the last talk, I uh, want to introduce you to Dr. Garrett Coughlin. Uh, I know Garrett very well. He qualified from UCD with a physio degree in 2004. And then he did his PhD in lower limb injuries and rehab in UCD in 2007. Apparently he had a great supervisor then. Um, over the last 15 years, he's gained a lot of uh, clinical experience and research experiencing ranging from private practice to elite sport, Currently working with uh, Mayo Senior Football, but he's spent a long time working with Connacht Rugby and has also worked with the National Rugby and National Hockey squads. Uh, Garrett is kind of uh, a bit of an outlier in that he's combined his clinical work with a very active teaching and research program. He's published uh, over 30 articles, primarily in the area of athlete profiling, concussion, lower limb rehab and assessment and as well as more recently, medical team game communication and positioning in field sports. Um, he previously competed as a middle and long distance athlete at national and international level and trained with Jerry and Mert for a period of time. And uh, he's currently living in Westport, right on the edge of Ireland with his uh, long suffering, beautiful wife and three children. Thanks, Brian. Thanks very much for the introduction. And I hit the wall on many occasions. Um, running marathons as well in my time. So I'm, as Brian explained there, probably a, a bit of a mixed background um, in terms of research and clinical work. And I think an awful lot of what's been presented today has obviously been very research-based, which is part of my presentation, but I'm also hopefully trying to leave you with some uh, clinical uh, pieces as well as part of that. And some of that as per um, the the presentation from Professor Moore earlier on is opinion and anecdotally orientated a little bit as well, but probably when we don't necessarily always have that research piece to back it up, um, hopefully it just gives a bit of an insight from some clinical experience as well that I've had. So just from my point of view, just um, I would have trained with, with Jerry and Mert when I was um, about 22 years old uh, for two or three years. And these are probably the two sort of iconic pictures for me of, of Jerry. One was how I knew Jerry when I was growing up in terms of looking at Irish runner and looking at Jerry winning Dublin marathons or Bally Cottons or wherever it was and trying to wonder what he was like and how good that he, how, how did he get as good as he was? The second one was then obviously Jerry as the coach and as the, the mentor um, and the person that I probably got to, or that I did get to know. Um, it's probably surprising that I'm, I'm even here because they, Jerry and I probably had a bit of a falling out when we were uh, coaching uh, me with immaturity, Jerry with his stubbornness, uh, and we ended up whereby for a reasonable period of time we didn't uh, converse with each other. Um, and then probably about 10 years ago, we had a, a connection again with each other. He ended up in hospital with my little brother uh, in the same ward, in the same, uh, the two of them beside each other in the bed. Um, and my brother was the, the polar opposite of me in terms that he wasn't a runner or the studious one, he was the the partier and the guy going out getting the girls. Uh, but what struck me always with that was just how, and reflected on today, was probably just Jerry's ability to connect with whoever he engaged with uh, uh, in his time. And thankfully, uh, albeit uh, sadly, just in terms of my, my brother passed away, but Jerry and I had uh, a connection after that. And the sort of agreement we left uh, was that we'd catch up with each other at a later date. Um, and unfortunately, we never did. So it's probably regrettable, but massively honourable for me to be here today, um, probably to honour Jerry as well. So sorry, no, I'm getting a bit upset. Now, shouldn't we get upset? <laughs> um, so, so just to thank Mart and Brian very much for the, the invitation, that it does mean a lot to me to come back and be able to do something like this for them. Um, so the session plan uh, for today uh, a little bit of a mix of things. Just want to give a brief overview on, on common running injuries, the risk factors for injury. Uh, again, as Professor Moore has outlined there earlier on, probably the, the question mark after injury prevention, just some technical considerations, and then just some suggested exercises as well um, for people to maybe consider as part of what they do. So the common running injuries piece, and, and again, we've been fortunate with the research that's there to have some 
more up-to-date and recent information around this. And this was a, a systematic review done uh, by a group in Loughborough. It was just published last year. And it looked at uh, non-ultra marathon runners and ultra marathon runners through a range of, of looking through lots of different studies over the years. And what they found in, in their, um, their research was, obviously, that we've, we've heard some of this already, was that the majority of injuries happened at the knee and below. And if we look at the, the sort of the two groups where you have the, the non ultra marathon runners and the ultra marathon runners, we can see that the, the, the high percentage of these injuries are in those particular areas. So the knee, ankle, the lower leg, the foot and the toes. Furthermore, then in that study, if we look at the type of injuries that are occurring, we've got there are patellofemoral pain syndrome, uh, medial tibial stress syndrome, fasciitis, tendonitis. All of these are really common overuse injuries that tend to happen in athletes. And I suppose for the most part, they are the, the most common injuries that we see in across the spectrum in an in athletic population. More recently, there was a, another paper published which looked back at uh, a range of European and world indoor and outdoor championships. And again, this group just looked at male and female athletes and trying to look at a comparison between the, the type of injuries that happened and the time loss resulting from those injuries and also what the events were that the people were competing in. And again, there's a, a wide spectrum of people here today. Um, but we can see that the ones with the combined events like the heptathlon or the decathlon are probably the highest injured group because of obviously the, the sporting demands that they have. Um, we've got our middle and long distances somewhere in the middle. And then we've got our, our more field based sports and walks are somewhere down the bottom. And again, there's been multiple studies looking into the, the differences in terms of gender injuries in terms of short distance and long distance injuries as well. And again, probably the, the biggest conclusion that I put together from looking through the research, which in fairness to me is not something I'd done recently, but until, until I went to prepare for this, this, um, this lecture today, there's a, such a dearth of information there in terms of the, the consistency uh, between the studies. And I think that's probably what um, the benefit of having something like the Insight Centre that's linking up the different universities uh, to try and have, I suppose, have a bit more of a, a cohesive approach towards actually trying to identify how these studies are structured and what they're trying to identify. Um, but we'll talk about risk factors in a second, but just basically the, the, the inconsistency with the studies has probably given us very little um, security around uh, defining what the most common injuries may be at times. Um, another systematic review, and again, just, just recently published, and again, this was from a, a multinational uh, group of people, and again, Professor Moore and I outlined a couple of these earlier on, but this was looking at injuries in, in short distance runners, and these were people who ran under sort of 15 kilometers a week, and then longer distance runners in terms of people running over uh, 15 kilometers per week. And again, as, as he outlined earlier on, it's the, the history of previous injury is the, the most common cause of injury. And that that spans all sports for the most part. In the sense, if you've injured a structure before, there's a pretty good chance you're probably going to hurt it again or injure another area on the back of that area you've been previously injured. Um, this review as well indicated that in, in the shorter running distances uh, group is that an awful lot of their injuries were actually attributed to uh, injuries that had not happened in, in running before. So a lot of these people may be coming from doing other sports or other activities and take up running and they've had a previous injury from that, which possibly leads to them having an injury when they take up athletics or a new sport. Um, and both of these um, areas in terms of the history of previous injury and the injuries not attributed to running have a reasonably good uh, support base for been risk factors for injury. Um, it's when we get on to, I suppose, the, the other areas here, like we've got our, our BMI, our age, our weekly running volume, our previous running experience. There's definitely much more lower to moderate quality of evidence to support that in terms of the risk factors towards us. And again, going back to what I said earlier, that inconsistency in terms of the, the research, the sample pools that they use. Again, going back to what Kieran said in terms of the follow up, the prospect of uh, quality of the studies, it's been very, very limited in terms of what we can actually truly take from that as to what the risk factors are. Um, the biomechanical pieces, Kieran, um, has, has outlined some, some nice areas around that. Um, and again, as a, as a physiotherapist working with um, athletes and, and people of all ages and different types of sports, this is probably what we 
um, from our end, they're probably trying to very broadly look at, I suppose, and then obviously look at it in detail on specific injuries to try and figure out, A, what's causing them, and B, how we're going to try and fix them. And again, this was from this um, systematic review just published this year, um, looking at, again, a, a large cohort of, of athletes. And again, we're seeing all these type of overuse type syndrome, syndromes again. And again, the majority of these are, again, about that below knee type structures, the ones that are getting injured. And we're looking at the color scheme here at the bottom in terms of strong evidence all the way down to conflicting evidence. And there's not a whole lot of green on the screen in terms of what actually causes these injuries to occur. So that provides a massive challenge for clinicians in terms of trying to figure out what's wrong, uh, how are we going to fix these people. And quite often, as, as again, Professor Moore outlined earlier on, it's down to that individual athlete and trying to identify what their deficits are and how we can start to try and address the deficits they may have. So injury prevention is probably the holy grail, and, and if it even exists, is a whole other other thing. Is uh, again has been been spoken about earlier, and again from from my end, I suppose the the most common things that I see in terms of um, errors that that people are are making or why people are getting injured um, comes down uh, in the most part. And this again, not just from a, a running perspective, but across sports, is essentially their training error. Um, in terms of, again, the acceleration too fast into um, in the intensity of training or the duration of training and um, the conditioning of the people that are, are doing the sport. So, again, the, the understanding that maybe not going out for a, a 30 minute run during the week as a kind of a filler to get more your, your miles, and actually potentially spending that on some strength work or some core work uh, instead. If you're if your time short, kind of a massive influence in terms of how strong people are conditioned to actually go and do the sport that's been required of them. Um, and again, it's probably something I see again and again where people are trying to push, push, push in terms of, of their higher mileage and probably not addressing some of the deficits they have, which would actually help them to improve in the mileage that they are running. Recovery, again, is probably one of the biggest issues for people, again, where majority of people here are indeed online or are in, in general not professional athletes and having that opportunity to recover and um, prepare for next training session and have that, uh, again, has been spoken about earlier, that adaptation to the training stress and the stimulus and not have that repeated tissue loading, again, is a, is a major factor. And then probably the most common thing that I see across the board is actually acknowledging that you're injured. And we again had the, the presentation about the, the niggles and the twinges and, and all that. And they just drag, they just drag and drag and drag for people. And uh, not that I'm trying to report business for um, the medical profession, but uh, if I probably had a euro for every, every person that came in and said, yeah, I've had this for the last three months and they're now presenting to me with the issue, whereas I probably had they got them within a week or, or, or so, would have been a very different outcome in terms of the development of a, a chronic condition that they have. So probably an early acknowledgement of, of, of an injury or a problem that they have and actually trying to address that much sooner. Um, again, from my personal experience, results in a, a far better outcome for people than, again, hanging on to that niggle for a much longer period. Um, again, Kieran, what I've spoken about, sort of the, the biomechanics and um, running technique and running form, etc., and I suppose I, I probably approach it from a slightly um, a different spectrum, um, albeit not, not too dissimilar, um, but probably some of the, the most common things for me in terms of trying to support a correct running style or running form in somebody is, is having the strength capacity to actually go and do that or the, the, the running form to go and, and, uh, and run fast. And again, just I'll get into these in a little bit more detail in a second, but, but broadly that involves the ability for someone to have an, an appropriate arm drive when they're running. Um, it involves them having stability through their trunk, uh, primarily along their, their front section here and on their, their outside section here. It involves their, their lateral hips being nice and strong, them having what is called a, a nice hip extension pattern so that they're able to, to push off the ground behind. And then, again, we, we spoke about that sort of ground interaction with the foot and what that sends up the chain in terms of having a, a co-contraction when we go into our, our landing position. And a co-contraction is basically multiple muscles trying to contract and stabilize numerous joints throughout our body to then allow us to absorb force to therefore actually try and propel ourselves forward with force as well. So broadly for me, what I'm looking at from a, a clinical perspective and people when they're coming into me is with a, a running related issue is 
very much based around these type of areas. And, and don't get me wrong, this is probably generic in terms of what I'm displaying today. It can be very different depending on the injury that the person has as well and the things you may need to address with them. So these, um, apologies for the model, but um, um, these were just probably just, again, just probably very broad categorizations by me. Um, in terms of what I, I probably see as a, a, a clinician as well. And I've got three sort of categories, and there probably could possibly be four categories here in the sense I've got the runner, the bopper, the rotator, and the fourth, which I didn't include, but is possibly there is the shuffler, um, which Jerry was a good proponent of as well, as Murch used to give him plenty of abuse for back in the day. Um, the runner for me... Um, in terms of this is probably the, the the better technique that I would like to have in, in one of the athletes I'm looking at, regardless of their sport, will involve them having um, a nice trunk lean. So they're again, they're getting their center mass forward from their hips. They've got a nice elbow drive in terms of their techniques, or again, that push off, which links into their hip extension on the other side. And then when I look at them front on, that they've got nice pelvic stability. So not basically getting a hip drop on one side. And what we'll also see again, and it was interesting, Kieran's presentation, he spoke about sort of that, um, the, the research they looked at into in terms of having that little bit of rotation forward as well with their arms to actually allow from, for that counterbalance of force with the opposite leg on landing too. So these are just some slow down videos of me on a trot here. I'm trying to suppose to, to demonstrate as best I can in a non-laboratory setting of what that type of technique would look like. If I move on to the bopper, this is the kind of person who probably um, looks like they're running particularly fast, but they're generating a lot of sort of vertical forces on their runs and they're literally bouncing along like this a lot of the time in terms of their run. Um, and what we see on, on this person is probably that little bit of a difference in terms of their, the angle of that trunk lean. It reduces their capacity to get as much hip extension behind here as well. Because they're trying to apply forces up the way a lot of the time, they tend to keep the hands a little bit higher and they're driving up here all the time in terms of this position and they don't end up with a, a huge amount of elbow drive as a result and most of their drive ends up in, in, a, in a vertical direction when they're running. So again, just to um, clip through on these, they've got sort of this long sort of hang time in the air when they're on their, their running stride because, as I said, they're generating all of that momentum uh, vertically up as opposed to having that more horizontal lean and drive forward. Um, from front on, it doesn't look look hugely different, and especially I'm probably on a, a too short a distance here to probably demonstrate this perfectly, but you again probably see that the arm drive, there's not a, a huge um, counter rotation compared to what we see on the, the other picture. And I, I've got these at the end just to sort of summarize those together. And then we have the rotator, um, who is the guy who's probably got the, the bruised knees um, a, a lot of the time uh, from, sorry, cracking into uh, himself on, on runs. Um, but this is the, oh, for some reason, that's just playing over itself. Let me see here. Um, yeah, here we go. So again, these are guys who are probably from a, a, trying to get that counterbalance from the opposite side, and they've got a, a significant pelvic drop on their running technique. And it's typically resulted in them not having, again, that, that appropriate arm drive through. They're carrying their arms in a low carriage position. And again, from a, a hip and a pelvic stability point of view, they're literally just collapsing side to side as they're in that running uh, technique, which almost goes into the sort of the, the shuffler category. Um, but again, they leak huge amounts of energy in terms of having this side to side and counterbalance all the time. Um, and again, just to try and show those kind of still frames of the, the sort of the three different techniques. Um, I like to think I was quite Ingebrigtsen like on this one. Um, but you can see probably just that, again, that trunk lean, the hip extension, the push off, the arm drive difference between the, the three different techniques on this. And then again, um, on the, the front on view, we've obviously got our, our runner and our bopper are reasonably similar, but then we get into our rotator who again is, is leaking a lot of that energy, um, energy side to side on their pattern. So, this was um, going to get on to sort of the, the exercises piece here in terms of, again, 
completely opinion uh, directed and anecdotal uh, and I don't make any apologies for that in the sense of um, I'll probably try to give some amount of research background and, and supporting what Kieran's already said um, but these are probably some some of the basic exercises I would use with some athletes in terms of trying to to help them prepare for um, getting some of those fundamental patterns in. Um, so challenges of doing these is when you've got your two-year-old uh, with you for the day and uh, this is little Luca who started school this week or sorry play school this week I should say uh, and surprised us all and uh, daddy was at home with him on Thursday and um, for love nor money uh, he was not letting me do these uh, at all and um, the the biggest problem and why I probably had to include this video was that when I went back sort of trying to cut the videos uh, after that night um Luca was in videos that I didn't even know he was in um, and he, he makes a guest appearance on on multiple episodes of this so my apologies in advance because I, I wasn't going to get the time to go back and repeat all of the videos again and uh, he makes sporadic little uh, engagements on it so um, that's Luca. So um, Brian Caulfield was actually going to demo some of these for me but um, Based on my experience of his athletic prowess down the years, I thought it might be safer for everybody and my insurance if we didn't do them. Uh, so here is goes in terms of um, we spoke about that that lateral hip stability um, that we we need and that trunk stability up in this section here of, of our trunk. And ag again, from a, a basic point of view, this side plank pattern and the progression of a side plank pattern is a real simple way of trying to hopefully try to strengthen these areas or pretend to try to activate these areas pre-training. So again, we don't need to um, start at the top in terms of the, the difficulty levels of these. Um, we go in a shorter lever position from our elbow through to our knee to make things nice and, and comfortable in that position for us. We can hold in that position or we can raise up our top leg in that position. We then could look to, to go into second version of this, which is lengthening that lever again to put more stress through this lateral trunk. And again, different versions of leg raises and that almost kind of running type positions on these. Again, to put more stress on this underside hip in this position. Um, that can then be progressed even further with a, a fairly simple band uh, set up tied off a, a fencing post or a pole, whatever it is, which is also bringing in a little bit of our arm drive pattern. But the row is also going to challenge that bottom hip a little bit further. And then in probably a little bit more of a conditioning space for us, um, adding in a, a light weight into that row pattern. And again, I'm trying to stabilize this hip in a bit more of a functional landing pattern there that I would have spoken about earlier on where we've got that kind of co-contraction piece going on. So again, it's just trying to, I suppose, take you through the spectrum of how you might just progress that through. And regardless of your, your level of activity or your capacities, um, you can basically start anywhere on this spectrum in terms of trying to, to strengthen some of those structures. Um, the other piece I spoke about again was that trunk stability along the front or the anterior core and also trying to link that in with our, our hip extension. So again, trying to minimize equipment use and stuff that people can use before they go into training. Um, two simple techniques here again. One is a, is a dead bug pattern. And again, I, I kind of work through a, a spectrum of lengthening levers here where I start off with my feet on the ground and then I go to extending out into that longer position on both sides. I've created a lot of tension with my arms pulling down towards my knees, which is forcing this anterior trunk to be nice and strong. And then I go into more leg lengths and longer lever positions to put a greater demand on that area. And as we look to try and, and strengthen people through this anterior trunk to try and teach to get into that forward lean and be stable in that forward lean, again, this is a nice way of training this. And things like front planks or um, supermans, any type of these exercises can all be used to try and start to, to train this area in people. Um, Again, trying to link in the, the hip extension piece here. So this back leg, again, is, is trying to be focused on that, that, that big guy behind, which gives us most of our power to drive us forward. And we're trying to link it in with the, the band here, just messing with the band in terms of different directions, again, to try and get us to engage this trunk at the front and keep us nice and stable as we're going through our pressing patterns. Um, I have two more videos to do, and I think this is where... Luca definitely jumps in and uh, makes it his own. Um, but the this is probably one of the 
I used to get abused from some of the guys in rugby over that if you had a fractured thumb that you could be doing this exercise with me and um, that it wasn't always for a lower limb injury. Um, but for me, this is looking at how we interact with the ground. And again, as Professor Moran's um, uh, presentation displayed earlier on, it, it is that ground contact, that rate of loading that we have on the ground. And again, how that's being controlled. So for me, a lot of people, when we go into the, the infamous heel strike four foot uh, categories, if they're in a heel strike position, a lot of times their inability to control that deceleration into that, that position as they land, and then to be able to stabilize that position before they go into their push off onto their next stride. So this tall lunge reach um, drill that we use is sort of a 90% weight on the front leg, about 10% weight on the back leg, and essentially it's trying to teach my hip, my knee, my ankle and my foot to interact with the ground and be stable in that position when it interacts with the ground. And by means of trying to progress that on, normally we do this by adding weight onto this. Um, I only have an 8kg kettlebell at home, um, I'm afraid, but you can go up to uh, any sort of weight with that in terms of like the, a lot of people who are doing this drill will be up around 16, 20 kilos. But again, you can do this body weight at the start of a training session to try and sort of, I, again, get that co-contraction pattern working for you. And then as some of them progresses through it, we're bringing them into that stepping pattern, teaching them to have that force absorption piece when they hit the ground to them, which will lead them into the, the force production piece, which is the, the next slide. And again, I've added in the, um, the, the dumbbells here just to demonstrate you can do this with more load. And, and the rationale for that is obviously when we hit the ground, we're hitting it at multiple times our own body weight. And we need to create stress through the system to, to actually reproduce those forces. The dumbbells I'm using are probably not going to replicate that force, but the speed of motion, trying to get heavier weight on that as we get technically correct at the form, will obviously try and help us in terms of how we're on that force absorption part of our running pattern. Um, the last piece of this is probably, again, it's, I have a term lateral hip stability, but it's also trying to focus on, on that hip extension piece. And again, I, I spoke about it at the start there in terms of somebody going into that tall lunge position here. That's their landing position. This drill here is called the hip lock pattern. And it's very much about trying to get someone to drive into that next phase of their running action. Um, and again, a, a lot of injuries, lower limb, we'd use this in terms of trying to work I suppose from the ground up in terms of the foot stability all the way up in terms of your control with your hip as well. And this does link in your trunk in that top position in terms of having to stay in that slight bit of a forward lean, as opposed we might see on the bopper whereby they're in this type of position here with the back hanging out because they're not getting any trunk stability at the front. So again, on this, just a simple body weight progression. Uh, that was the one where I definitely realized Luca was kind of running behind me and a B just joined in on this one as well. Um, but the, the the pattern of this, again, is trying to, to teach that hip to, you can see I start off in like the tall lunge reach position. I'll go side on here just so you can see that now. And again, I'm trying to propel myself up into that forward drive position here. And again, there's there's multiple versions of this that you can press, progress on to in terms of driving onto steps, et cetera, in front of you to get that bit more forward propulsion. But as an initial way of trying to cue this and educate someone this pattern, this is what we would use. Um. And again, you can add this in in terms of the, the weighted part of this. Again, this is this the mighty 8kg kettlebell I have at home. Um, again, you may not use a whole lot more than that in terms of that overhead pattern because it just becomes diminishing returns. If I've got a, a 20kg kettlebell over my head in this position, a lot of people are going to struggle to actually support that just from a, an overhead press point of view. So again, not essential, but like a, a, a 2.5kg or a 5kg plate or even a med ball can do a lot of the same things and create that little bit more demand on you to try and support yourself. And then so the, the final progression, this is just trying to make it into a little bit more of a, a dynamic pattern again. And I'm just doing a little bit of a, a lateral version of this here, but you can obviously do a, a forward version of it as well. And again, this is trying to just get me into that landing and that prop propulsion forward position to try and train that lateral stability, that hip extension and that trunk control. So as I said, the what I presented to you there is is anecdotal, it's opinion uh, related, I don't mind. Uh, that's what I use a lot of the time in terms of uh, basic starters for a lot of people and stuff that I find really effective um, with what I'm trying to do with, with trying to return people to running. Um, the idea being that A, it hopefully resolves the, the injury that they have and when we talk about that running form, 
I hope you can see that there's some relationship there to some of the, the biomechanical considerations that we spoke about earlier on and also the areas that we're getting injured, that if we're trying to strengthen these areas a little bit more, it hopefully result in us being injured a little bit less as well and get to enjoy what we do. And that's me. Thank you very much.